I'm Davis Hammond. I'm here to talk about uh, the Crownshield family of which I am a part. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as a bit of an icon, apparently. My family, <clears throat> my mother's side of the Crownshields, my mother is the, one of the daughters of Catherine Crownshield. She was the sister of Frank and Benjamin Crownshield, who are the ones that spent a lot of time down here in Boca Grande. And because my mother <clears throat> was related to Frank and Louise Crownshield, we used to come down here as kids. My parents came down here obviously before we came down as children, so we spent lots of holidays here. I guess my first memory of Boca Grande must be somewhere around 1946 or seven when we came down stayed in a little place called Palm Cottage and played around in the hot sun for the first time after the Second World War. And it was a pretty magical place. You'd come down by train, spend two or, th two or three hundred hours on the train or so it seemed, get out at the station and be met by relatives, get carted off to some fancy big meal over at Las Olas and then taken to play on the beach. And from there, just endless good fun and tropical life. So that was from about 1947 until 1958, the year my great aunt Louise Crownshield died, was a regular part of our life as a family. We would come down here every spring for the holidays, school holidays, Easter holidays, and with other, other little Crownshield cousins and We'd all be stashed away in various cottages out here, one of which I'm living in now, inherited from my mother, who inherited it from her Uncle Frank and Aunt Louise when they died. Obviously, the island has changed a lot, but it's still pretty exciting when we come across the bridge. My great uncle Frank Crownshield and Aunt Louise Crownshield were a very important uh, part of our life. They had no children. So my mother and my uncle and my aunt all were sort of surrogate children. We all lived together on a little place called Peaches Point on Marble Head. And then we all foregathered again down here in Boca Grande. So <clears throat> I basically grew up in Marble Head and, and Las Olas when my great aunt Louise Crownshield died, I inherited her wonderful orange and cream colored Buick station wagon. It had Las Olas printed on one side and Eleutherian Mills on the other. The Eleutherian Mills referred to the DuPont place that they lived in in Montchan and Delaware. We didn't go there much. That was on the winter schedule and we didn't partake in that much. My parents did, but I did not, so I can't tell you much about that. The life I can tell you about was in Marblehead, Massachusetts, where, as I say, we lived next door to the Uncle Frank and Louise Crownshield, and then down here in Boca Grande. They were sort of fairy godmother and father to us. We were, um, as I say, a very large family because my aunt and my uncle and their families and us all lived together in this little compound and so when I think of Boca Grande it's always train trip from Boston somehow arrive in this magical place come out of the mud season in New England and arrive in the tropical paradise 
and all our little cousin pals around and we'd all pack into these different houses and the Crown and Shield chauffeurs and maids would be bringing us food and driving us around different places. Picnics out on the Casarina, that was Uncle Frank's boat. We'd all get packed off for picnics. That was everyday routine, as it were. You'd get put on the Casarina. We'd go out to little Gasparilla Island, usually. Nobody out there. I think there were some fishing shacks. And Aunt Louise was a great lover of nudism. So we would land on the beach and then everybody would take their clothes off and all the men would go south and the women would go north and we'd go splashing around. Tom Amidon uh, took over from Sam Whidden, had been Uncle Frank's boatman for long, long early years. But after Sam Whidden died, Tom Amidon uh, came on as the boatman. I did not know Sam Whidden, so I can't speak of him, but Amidon was a very colorful character. He had an old schooner, which he kept out there in the harbor, out by our boathouse. I think he was a nudist too. My guess is he spent all summers stark raving mad on that schooner, but then he'd come back and do as a boatman for Uncle Frank. My father used to go quail shooting with Uncle Frank. Uh, I don't know anything much about that, and not being much of a fisherman, I can't tell you much about the fishing exploits either. But, um, but picnics for sure, and cavorting around on, on the beach was the great thing. In those days, of course, the beach was marvelously free of everything, except possibly us and people from First Street up to Journey's End. There were groins that went out into the, into the Gulf then. And people who have been here on the island for a while remember them. We had a crazy Irish setter who used to gallop up and down the beach. My mother was, thought she was the best looking dog ever. She'd foam at the mouth and run up and down the beach. And we children just cavorted on the beach day in and day out, usually got blisters all over the you know, covered with wicked sunburns for the first day or two, often have to spend a day recuperating with towels, suppurating postules on our backs and shoulders, things like that. It was pretty magical. I can't think of anything unpleasant really happening. There were surprises, obviously. Um, we would go down to the boathouse. You had to go from here down First Street, and the, it was a little black village on the on the right hand as you went down, we knew everybody in there because a lot of those black people worked for my Aunt Louise in the kitchen or working around the place or doing various jobs. In the evening, we would go down to the south dock uh, and go out on the dock, which was more or less closed, but somehow we were allowed out there uh, to go shrimp fishing at night. And you, it was magical. The lights would be shining out along under the piers and you'd take your fish net out there, crawl down in under the understructure under the thing and, and dip for shrimp. So, so I remember that a lot. Otherwise we were more or less told we weren't supposed to be down on the south end of the island. So basically we, we weren't down there much, but at night we would go down and do a little of that. My great uncle and aunt entertained a lot. So Although we were always here en masse in the family, there were always all sorts of house guests up there at the, at the main house. And my, my father and my, and my uncle and my aunt would say, oh, Christ, we've got to go down to Madame the Queen's for supper. And so my parents would all get dressed up at night, put on a long dress, my mother, a long dress, get on their bicycles and pedal up to the house. One of the amusing things that my uncle Frank, who was often grouchy. And as I look back on it, I realize now that he was old and sick. I, he died in 1950. I was uh, heading off to school and to boarding schools, a, a little second former at St. Paul School. So I, I can recognize now that he must have been pretty unhappy to see a bunch of rowdy children arriving and bothering him all the time. But he, he used to go out and paint around on the backside of the pool and they had these wretched macaws that would be hanging around the place. We were, we, we were rather frightened of them because they had been known to take bites out of house guests' back legs when you were least expecting anything nasty. And Uncle Frank, we thought he was a kind of an interesting character because he, he used to come out, we'd be in the pool maybe running around, and he would come out and stand under the tree on the south end of the house and say, 
you're no damn brother of mine to this bird up in the tree. <laughs> it shouted out and we thought, who's he talking to? We thought our uncle was a, was a strange character. But we loved him, but he was, he, was, he was a little shy of us. He had a wonderful white horse named Cheyenne who kept in the, what's now uh, <clears throat> of the Corsini's bought it and now it belongs, I think, to, uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the stable. So we had a horse there. So we used to go by and give it apples and ride it bareback up and down on the beach. Um, after my uncle died in 1950, we kept coming down all the time and Aunt Louise still ran everything and, and was as busy entertaining house guests as ever. So we kept coming down. And when she died, she got very sick and died in 1958. I know my mother came down and met her and picked her up and took her home to die in the, in the, on the train. That was a very difficult time in the family. Um, I was away in France at the time. So when my great aunt Louise Crown and she'll die, there was a real blow to our family because she had been a great great presence, a great love of everybody, kept us all happy and cheerful and laughing. When she died, uh, everything kind of changed. Uh, the island changed too, obviously. So did France. I was in France at the moment studying in the Sorbonne and that brought on the Fifth Republic. Uh, back here at Boca Grande, it brought the end of the railroad, basically, and the bridge. And when the bridge came, that changed the island pretty dramatically. And what changed it even more dramatically for us, obviously, in a parochial way, was the death of, of Aunt Louise. So the property got all divided up between the four, <coughs> the four uh, nieces and nephews of, of, of Frank Crown and Shield. Um, my mother was left the house I'm in now, where I'm sitting, uh, and, uh, and the two houses between here and the school. Uh, my Aunt Emily Record got left Las Olas, and my Uncle Link Davis got left various other houses around. I don't remember which ones. We all got, they all got left a whole batch of little cottages. My Aunt Emily Record <clears throat> sold Las Olas to a nice man named Hampton, Hampton Barnes. For those of you who are up on Boca Grande history, you'll know that's why the barnacle is spelt B-A-R-N-I-C-H-O-L instead of B-A-R-N-A-C-L the way it should be. It's named because Mrs. Mrs. Hampton Barnes and Mrs. Nichols, her friend, thought it would be a good idea for Boca Grande to have a hardware store. So they bought, they made the, bar, the Barnacle hardware store. That's why it's called that. Anyway, so that, that Las Aulas was sold and my uncle Link Davis sold his part. But my mother, the baby in the family, decided to keep, keep the house. And so we stuck it out here on Boca Grande ever since. So that was in 1958 when Louise Crownshield died and my mother died in 1992 and left these three houses to her children. That's my older brother Jim and me, the Lincoln, Lincoln Davis, the middle one, and my, our little brother Ned Hammond, who lives in the middle house. One of the great things about Boca Grande is that we still have a few casuarina trees here. Some people don't like them. The state says they're invasive, but without the casuarinas, we never would have had an island here. They, they made the island, they make the island, they are our mountains. Um, anyway, so I always like to make a little plea for the Katarina tree. If you're ever down here when it's foggy, go and stand under one and you'll feel as if it's raining on you. It's absolutely delightful. And the breeze blowing through them makes a lovely sound. Just absolutely wonderful. For those of you who live on um, down there in Boca Bay, I should point out that in, in the part of life that I lived here in Boca Grande, that was, of course, uh, the Boca Grande Hotel and its golf course, as well as the military preserve. So in my childhood here, there was just a great desert from here, First Street, all the way down to the South Dock when life jerked up again. But after the railroad stopped, we used to still come down here by plane. Um, so we would fly, I guess, to 
Tampa, and then my father would hire these little cub, Piper Cubs or whatever, and we would fly down and land in what used to be the golf course over there on what is now Boca Bay. That was all, the old hotel was still kind of falling to pieces and then was completely raised. So for four or five years in there, must have been in the fifth, I don't know, the late 50s, <clears throat> early 60s, all through there, we would just come in the little planes, land over in what's now Boca, Boca Bay and walk up to the house here. It was pretty, pretty convenient. <laughs>